everybody. Today, we are going to have Brother Piercy join us to talk about identity. So sit back and enjoy the video. We are just waiting for him to join us. So just give us a few minutes. We'll work out the technology and we'll begin this spiritually led talk soon. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe. All right, I am just going to let him join real quickly. So just wait. Hello? Hey, hang on. I can't hear you for some reason. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Bear with me. It's not you. It's me. Guarantee it. Um, That's what it is. How about now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. I can hear me, but or I can't hear you. Try one more time. Okay. Hot dog. All right, hang on one second. I've got a I've got a microphone that I use. Hang on. Let's do one more check. Okay, check your audio. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm losing your audio when I do that. So mm -hmm. stand by. I can see you. Yeah, hot dog. All right, hang on. I'm trying to use a different, I'm trying to use a different system than I normally use, and it's you may have to back up and punt. Bear with me here. Uh, how you been doing? Good, and you? You know, I'm too busy for my own good. That's the truth. Uh, I want to blur my background so you don't see my messy office. Okay. Cool. Is everything working now? Maybe. Hopefully. Maybe. <laughs> Just take my... You gotta work with it. That's true. All right, hang on one second. Let me let me shut my door back here. How's the weather up there? It's getting warm. Not oh cold. my goodness. It's like a thousand degrees down here. Wow, it's like I think like 60. Oh, my love. Cloudy, cloudy and rainy lately. We've had no rain for like three weeks. It's 98 degrees. No joke. It is so hot. Just staying warm there. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah, it's been without, pretty cool down here. Without a doubt. It's crazy. All right, let me pull up one other thing and I'll be ready to roll. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Let's begin with the first question. What is your personal view on identity? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be on your podcast. I think it's really cool. I love what you're doing. And uh, we just started a podcast. You kind of inspired me, just to tell you the truth, at my church. And so uh, we just started a podcast not long ago. So I love what you're doing. And I love this question. The personal view on identity is, it's a big question. But I think it's some something that we should contemplate as individuals and as church leaders, we should contemplate as well. I think ultimately, if we're thinking about identity, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, which is the origin of all things. Uh, Genesis is the beginning of, of everything. It's the, it's the story of, of creation and, and the origin, the, the, the original, the OG. That's what we're looking for. And so there in Genesis, the text says that God created man in his own image. Mm -hmm. And he, God created he, him, male and female created he, them. And so if we're, if we're looking at the base question, what is identity? How do we identify? It goes back to our created gender, how God created us. Mm -hmm. And a, a man created in the likeness and the image of God uh, should identify as a man or a male as a man. Uh, the same with a female, a woman as a woman. 
Um, both are created in God's likeness and after his image. And so at its at its core, at its at its most base elements, I think that identity begins there. It begins with uh, the understanding that those two genders were created by God exclusively mm-hmm. in his image and after his likeness. But then identity it blossoms from there. Uh, the beautiful thing about God's creation is it is so deep and so vastly intricate. And while I could say, as a man, I am the same as other men created in the likeness and image of God as a male and and, and as a masculine man, uh, I can also say that all of us are very vastly different because we identify uh, with our our specific. Uh, our specific little uh, little idiosyncrasies, our our personalities, our our uh, predispositions, of course, our genetics and our 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 DNA is all very very individualized, and that's the beautiful thing. As 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 my definition being biblically centered of identity goes, someone could say, well, that's very boring, man, mm-hmm. woman, but in reality, it's not boring at all. Uh, because it is out of that, out of that awesome likeness mm-hmm. and imagery of God that all of the very specific and individualistic character traits of men and women throughout time and ages, and even now, express themselves to be the indi- individuals that they are. Mm-hmm. A man largely identifies himself with what he does. Um, most men who are communicating with one another, that's one of the first questions that they ask one another. What do you do? What do you do for a living? What kind of work do you do? Men are doers and they identify as doers and they identify themselves as what they do. And so whether you're a, a, you know, a welder or a lawyer, a doctor or a trash picker upper, you know, or a ditch digger or a preacher, uh, uh, you know, a, a missionary or an evangelist or whatever it is you do, most men associate their identity with what they do. Uh, women are different, thank God. And they differ not just in terms of what they do, but it's it's more a matter of who they are as a whole. Uh, women are more complicated, without a doubt. And so who they are as a whole is how they identify. And most of the time, as a woman matures, I've seen this uh, in my in the life that I share with my wife, for instance. Uh, her identity went from being just uh, a woman and then my wife and now to a mother role. And it's kind of like a rose unfolding. It It's truly... All of that was within her from the beginning, quite literally. It's an it's an amazing thing that all of that was within her from the beginning. But over time and through relationship and covenant, that her identity has blossomed and and unfolded as as a man's does as well. But with a woman, it's it's most beautiful and and intricate um, by God's design. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I like how you pointed out like how it's like a flower because that gives people good imagery of how it looks like when your identity becomes all this. Because when you're young, you're usually not a mother. So then eventually you learn how to do the motherly like things and you identify as a mother because you're like, I know how to care for children. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. And before I didn't know how to do that. And the same is true somewhat of fathers as well. You know, men men migrate into the the role of a husband and then the role of a father, you know, if God wills that. And and that's a beautiful thing as well. And the the incredible thing is uh, your generation has not has not had these conversations applauding these roles Mm -hmm. of, of man and woman, husband and wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, father and mother, and and these quite literally are God's elite plan mm-hmm. for humanity. The 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 identity, even God's identity, is revealed in these roles. We understand Him to be our everlasting Father. Mm-hmm. Uh, we understand that Christ was made of a woman. God sent forth His only begotten Son, made of a woman. God 
God chose motherhood to reveal his Messiahship. And, and Jesus as Messiah was the express image of the person of God. That's what the book of Hebrews says. And so even God's identity is connected to the imagery and the likeness that we see with male and female. So it's a, it's a, frankly, you asked me a massive question, you know, how do I view identity? And it, it's an enormous question because ultimately we have to go back to God and his likeness and his imagery. And then we also have to go forward through time, through the Old Testament to the point that Jesus was born and understand that, that everything that God was spiritually in the Old Testament, he is revealed to be physically in the New Testament in Christ Jesus. But, but that's even taken further as it relates to us. Paul to the Colossians said that we are hid in Christ. And our our only identity is when Christ is revealed, when he appears, when his image and when his identity is revealed, then in him we are revealed as well. And so salvation is is another step. You know, we, we talked about the natural roles of, of man and woman, husband and wife, father and mother. But then we go into the understanding of the spiritual significance of those identities. And that is it, when we're saved, when we're born again of water and the spirit, we become hidden in him and 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 our identity is 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 his name and and his likeness and his image and his glory those things are upon us and and we lose those those carnal elements of who we are as as human beings and take on the spiritual elements of who he is as our savior mm -hmm, that's so true all right next question what does god say about identity a lot a whole lot. Um, God absolutely cares about uh, how we identify. Um, I, I was having a conversation today, and it was it was with my wife and some mm -hmm. folks on our pastoral team in our church, and the conversation was centering around how important self perception is, because that really affects our perception of of God and how God sees us. So that's a that's a dilemma. How do we solve that? And the answer is the scripture. The answer is always going to be the scripture affirmed by the spirit. That's always the answer. But but Jesus made a statement in John 10 and 10. He said that the thief comes not except for to steal, to kill and to destroy. And you mentioned earlier I, when I came to the youth convention for the Alaska Yukon district, I preached the message valor and virtue defending our identity and our image. Um, and I made this statement there. I'll repeat it now. Uh, the progression is Satan has to steal your identity in order to kill your soul and destroy God's image. That's really what it's about. Satan does not inherently hate people. He hates God. But because people are created in the likeness and the image of God, and we taking on the glory of God, which Satan desperately wanted for himself, he understands that first, it, it, he if he can steal our identity and kill our soul, then, then that's when he can destroy God's image and, and God's likeness, which is, which is what we are. So I think that's what Jesus was really talking about. Uh, it was truly he was talking about identity. He was talking about image, um, and 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 in, then in the New Testament, uh, let me go back. In the Old Testament, imagery was was very important in terms of identity as well, uh, and that's really what idol worship is about. Uh, men and women would create graven images. This is why in the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, God mm -hmm. had. Uh, don't make any graven image because a graven image was not an image of God or a God. It mm -hmm. was, it was a reformed image of either man, mankind or nature created for false worship, engineered for false worship. And God knew that. Um, so when he, when he, when he forbade idolatry, when God said, don't make any graven images, he knew it, it, it would be this inverted downward regression, mm -hmm. spiral downward if people created images that were basically just a souped up image of themselves that they worshiped and, and humanity would go downward. 
And ultimately, human beings would only identify as being human and nothing else when truly we are spiritual beings, not only not only mortal beings. Mm -hmm. So so God, that was that was God's agenda there when he when it wasn't God just being mean, don't have any graven images. It was God saying you are more than a reflection of yourself fashioned in stone. You are more than that. And in our generation, Abby, that that's. I, I want to tell everybody who watches your pack, podcast. I want to. I want to tell you. You are more than your Instagram post. You are more than that filtered image that you're trying to put out there and get likes from your peers on. Uh, New Testament idolatry is not is not some figurine that you have on your nightstand. New Testament idol- idolatry is is pride that is most often revealed in in social media posts. Mm-hmm. And so, so God God spoke of that in the New Testament when he when he talked about identity and and image and and uh not being not being prideful or, or puffed up in 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 self and in selfishness and but beyond that in the base things in Genesis chapter 1 God created man and woman Jesus reaffirmed that in the New Testament and and he connected that to to marriage and he said that in the beginning uh, God created male and female and from that time God had orchestrated that a man would leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and so God is talking of identity there and and affirming that thing that we talked about a few moments ago when we when we talk about marriage and how how we how we grow into those roles and they should be celebrated and they should be they should be admired and they should be honored uh, and not defiled and disregarded. But then, but then you you know you could say, well, what what about now? You know, you're you're much too young to marry. I'm sure your parents will appreciate me saying that. Uh, but what about now? What about in what about in your child years and in your preteen years, your adolescent years, your teen years, and your young adult years? Um, there, those are those are years where God is is nurturing you through ministries and through uh, good wholesome parental guidance. And there is a distinction there. Um, Paul illustrated that in Corinthians, specifically relating to uh, hair. Scripture says that it is a shame for a man to have long hair, but if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her. And so we see that image and identity are connected. How mm-hmm. I portray myself with my haircut and how you portray your yourself with your uncut hair are directly linked to God's commandments of image and identity. And I got to tell you, it's not something I'm ashamed of. Mm-hmm. As a man and as a, as a husband to a wife and a father to a daughter and a son, I have absolutely no shame in the fact that my wife and daughter do not cut their hair and no shame in the fact that my son and I do keep our hair cut because there is a, there is a distinct difference that God wants to establish between men and women. And, and when in the, one of the primary ways that he did that is he illustrated that through the apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church and to us, uh, the same principles for us. So, so there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of truth in the text, uh, about identity, but also how image is linked to identity as well. And, you know, here, here's the amazing thing, um, that text was written about 2000 years ago, but it's still as relevant today as ever because mm-hmm. someone wanting a man or a woman wanting to, uh, wanting to, um, and we're going to breach this gap just here, wanting to go through this process of being transgender, transferring from one gender to another. That's one of the first things that they begin to change. And, and that is how they present themselves with their hair on their head. And they're trying to identify as something else with a different image than what they were born as uh, by the design of God. And, and that's why it's so important that, that we maintain this. Um, it's a, it's a, it has never been a more clear statement that I belong to God than it is now for a man to have uh, cut short hair and for a woman to have long uncut hair. Um, it's it's there is truly a an inseparable connection between uh, image and identity. Mm-hmm. That's so true. 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about like value and virtue and what that means and yeah. what's the difference between those two and stuff like that? So the basis of that question, I think, is rooted in that message that I preached at the Alaska Yukon Convention. Yeah. Your youth president texted me the other day, and one of the most encouraging texts I've had in so long, he said at y'all's youth camp, there were guys and ladies that were going around with those bandanas that represented valor and virtue. And that's so cool. That's that's one of the most encouraging things that I've heard. Um, valor and virtue, it, those two words show up in English, in the Old Testament, but they come from the exact same Hebrew word. And translated, it means strength, ability, efficiency, wealth, force, and army. And what I come to realize when I studied that text is that God doesn't have a lesser power for women than he does men in his kingdom. He doesn't have a lesser role for women in his kingdom versus men. Conversely, he, he doesn't have a, a greater level of importance of women in his kingdom over men. There it's it's not even about equality necessarily. It's it's about equity. God understands that in order for his kingdom to function as it should, he needs both men and women. And and the the impact that a man has and is designed to have in the kingdom of God should be a valiant impact. And the impact that a woman should have in the kingdom of God should be a virtuous impact. Uh, one without the other is incomplete. God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for man to dwell alone. Can you imagine? God has literally just finished creation. I mean, he has just finished it. And, and the only element of his creation that he looked at and said, not good enough was the man that he created. And so the scripture says that he created woman to be a help me. And that is, that's so indicative of how God feels about men and women in his kingdom. That is one without the other is incomplete. I am not a chauvinist and neither do I believe that feminism has a place in the kingdom. Paul said that in God's kingdom, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, bond or free. He was not saying there's not distinctives. Absolutely, there are distinctives. But what he was saying is God is not looking at one as superior. When it comes to authority, absolutely. Paul said the head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. There is an obvious order of authority there as it relates to spiritual authority. Mm -hmm. But consider the, the administration of... Uh, a man's role or a woman's role in the kingdom of God, a man having a valiant uh, administration and a woman having a virtuous administration. One is no more important than the other. One is no more influential than the other. One is no less impactful than the other. The truth is it really does take both for us to see God's will and his, his plan for his, sons and his daughters in the kingdom of God. And that's today. It's not just the Old Testament. That's today. I, I deeply believe that we need strong men and strong women, uh, men and women with abilities, men and women that are efficient. And 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 I'm, I, I, I catch, a, catch a little heat for this occasionally, but I believe that God wants to make men and women in his kingdom in the end time wealthy, not for the sake of, of you know, creating this imagery of, look at me, I'm wealthy. But I believe that God in your generation, Abby, I, I believe that God can take people in your generation and through their abilities and through their efficiencies, give them wealth. And they're not going to sponsor one missionary. They're going to fully sponsor entire entire ministries that that reshape, reshape the the spiritual atmosphere of places and people all over the earth. And they're going to do that through their wealth. God did that with Solomon in the old Testament. He can do it in the new Testament. I, I fully believe that. And of course, you know, Paul instructed Timothy endure hardness as a good soldier, fight the good fight of faith. And, and this, this spiritual warfare and this army element of valor and virtue is not just for the men, it's for the women as well. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's my, 
illustration from the Old Testament in the New Testament of how men and women are supposed to operate in the kingdom of God today. That's so true. Anything else you'd like to add on the topic identity? Um, I, we just finished our camp meeting, and I was thinking about this podcast, uh, actually, during our camp meeting. Brother Bernard was preaching in our camp meeting Wednesday night, and, and he made this statement, and I think it's probably the the most impactful statement that I've heard lately relating to identity, specifically mm -hmm. transgenderism. He said that um, a generation of, of uh, parents and grandparents removed gender distinctions and they were sowing to the wind. And now they are reaping the whirlwind in their children and grandchildren, the harvest of transgenderism. And I think that's one of the most powerful statements that I've heard in a long time. Um, you know, the incredible amount of confusion, God is not the author of confusion, the incredible amount of confusion that's in our generation as it relates to, am I a man or am I a woman? Am I a boy or am I a girl? Am I a male or am I a female? The, the incredible amount of confusion that young people are having today is not inherently from within them. It's it's came it's come it's coming through them because they see parents and grandparents that have removed uh, gender distinctives, and so you have that image and that identity of male and female, uh, dad and mom, husband and wife being brought into question by moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas. Mm -hmm. And so that that questioning is is being expressed through young people. They'll always take it a step further. Your kids will always take a step further, whatever you do or don't do. They'll take it a step further. And and their step further is transgenderism, which is which is tragic. It it, it to think to think that not only are our children having to solve this dilemma on their own, uh, it's being further complicated by by parents with absolutely um, no moral grounding when they are encouraging them to the point of mutilating themselves. That that's a that's a serious concern. But I, I want I want anybody who's listening to your podcast or, or watching this podcast to know that that God absolutely loves them. And and those questions that they have doesn't mean that God doesn't love them or God doesn't exist to them. The truth is those questions are are natural and God has the answer. His word has the answer. His spirit affirms the truth. And I guarantee you there's a church and a church family close to that person that will love them, care for them, and help them come to the right conclusions as it relates to their identity and their image in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Can you please end us in prayer today? Absolutely. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this podcast and for this conversation. I pray that you bless every person that's involved in this conversation. And I pray, Lord, that you would draw them closer to you. I pray, Jesus, that your healing virtue would be upon us as people and touch our land, heal our nation. Jesus, we pray and make us who you've called us to be in your kingdom, in our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. God bless you. God bless you too. Bye.